a lot of times I think our focus is wrong. I think we focus on the wrong things at the wrong time for reasons that we don't always understand. Right? I, I've, been in a, uh, I, I've, I've been to a swimming pool as a child. It was a public pool in McKinney, Texas. And McKinney, Texas has changed a lot since I was a child. Now it's a thriving suburb of Dallas. But at the time, it was kind of out in the sticks. Um, and, I, and I went to the public pool, the city pool in McKinney, Texas. Uh, and there were lifeguards on duty at the, at the pool. And the lifeguard's job is to make sure that all of the rules are followed on the, the big thing that's posted on the fence and rules like no glass containers inside of the the fenced in area right no running around the pool no rough housing no this no that uh, no diving in this end and every so many minutes kids have got to get out so parents can i don't know what adults do in adult swim right and, and the lifeguard's job uh, is ostensibly to keep those rules in in line and they did a great job. I got yelled at for running, I don't know how many times, at the McKinney City Pool. I mean, because, right, you get out and you want to get where you're going really quickly, and it's 128 degrees on the concrete. And so running is what you do. And the lifeguard would blow their little whistle and be like, whoop, walk, don't run, right? And then I'd be like, okay, and then I'd power walk to where I was going. And five minutes later, I'd have the same problem. I'm sure they enjoyed kicking people out who brought in glass bottles or outside food or whatever. You know, have you ever looked at the list of rules at a swimming pool? There is uh, 25 rules on how to swim in a swimming pool, right? It, it amazes me how many rules there are, but you know, it would be very easy for a lifeguard to focus on those rules and to miss out on the reason that they're paid to be there. You know, the purpose of a lifeguard at a swimming pool is not to police glass bottles, right? The purpose of the lifeguard is to make sure that when a head slips under the water, that they're there to drag that person back to the surface. And if the focus of the lifeguard has, has gone away from life saving and life protecting to rule enforcement, they're gonna run into all sorts of problems when real things happen. Because there may be a kid running over here while someone is drowning over there. Right? And instead of helping the drowning victim, they may blow their whistle and politely ask that young child to walk, don't run, while someone's life slips away. Guys, our focus is important. What we choose to focus on matters, and I really think a lot of us, we get crossed up. Or we focus on things that seem important. They seem like they're, they're, they're of ultimate importance, but, but, but I'm telling you, it's not the right thing. And today we're looking at the end of the book of Mark. That is a thankful word for me to say. I started in the book of Mark in January, and to the best of my knowledge, it's now October. Um, and so we have reached the end of Mark. If you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 16. Last week, uh, we dealt with the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus walked his life, did all of his teachings, his miracles, uh, taught his disciples how to go and to serve and to be his hands and feet in the community. We watch his disciples scatter at Jesus' arrest. We see them not present at his crucifixion. But through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but the wrath of God is satisfied. God isn't angry at us anymore, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. God's not mad at you today. Right? Some of you have had pretty bad weeks, and you feel pretty down on yourself. You think, I'm a screw-up, I failed, I'm not, I'm not doing the things that I know I should do. I want you to know you probably are a screw-up and you probably did fail, but God loves you. He's not mad at you anymore. His wrath was satisfied on the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus bore our wrath so we don't have to bear it on ourselves. He went, goes into the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of Christ, lays him in this tomb. And we know the end of the story, most of us at least, guys. He comes back. Someone, someone told me, um, maybe it was last week, and I was talking to someone in the office, and I said, hey, uh, uh, yeah, I'm finishing the book of Mark this week. And they're like, oh, I'm not going to be there. And I was like, it's okay. He comes back. Right, right. Like it's, it's not exactly the best kept secret in churches that Jesus Christ doesn't stay dead, but it's the most important thing. It's the most important fact of Christianity that our Savior, our hero, our victor doesn't stay dead. 
right? I mean, every, everyone else dies. Everyone else goes to the grave. You can go visit the prophet Muhammad in his grave, the, uh, the, the man who founded Buddhism, right? There, there's a spot, and we say, man, this is where he lived and died, but Jesus doesn't have that spot. You can visit uh, a tomb that they say might have been his tomb, but you can go in there because you know what? There's not a corpse in that tomb. He came back, and we pick up on that day, right? Uh, Jesus was crucified on a Friday. On Saturday, um, the Jews do no work. They don't go and do uh, anything, and so Saturday he laid in the tomb, and early Sunday morning, once the sun came up, um, the women went to go finish the preparation for Jesus' body, right? When you bury someone back in that day, um, you have things you have to do to, um, to make sure the body uh, is preserved properly. And they were going to take care of that just a, a day and a half after um, the death of Jesus. And it says this, starting in verse 1 of chapter 16 of the book of Mark, it says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome... Um, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? So these ladies are doing good things, right? Their focus is on taking care of the body of Jesus Christ. And so they go and they spend their money to buy the proper spice mix, uh, to rub on the body of Jesus Christ, and they're going to the tomb, but their focus is on the dead Jesus Christ. Their entire mind is on this man that we love, this man that we followed is no longer with us, and we have to take care of him. And then as they go, they ask a question which seems ridiculous now. They say, who's going to move the stone for us? There's a gigantic stone um, that was rolled in front of the tomb of Jesus Christ, right? You would roll a stone in front of a tomb because, um, like, I don't know if you've ever had, like, a rat die in your wall before, right? But it, it stinks the whole house up. Decaying dead animal is, is not a good smell. And so they would do that with tombs, right? You seal the tomb up so that as the body breaks down and becomes less than appetizing to be around, the smell stays locked away inside of the, the, the vault that, that he's in. But the stones are big. And we know from other gospel accounts, the stones just aren't big. This stone was big and protected. There was Roman soldiers stationed at either side of the tomb of Jesus Christ to make sure that no one messed with the giant rock that was in front of the tomb. And so they're asking themselves the question, who will move the stone for us? There are, there are ladies that can't move the stone on their own. They're going to need uh, a couple of, of strong men, you know, guys like myself, to go out there and move the stone, right? Big, strong, strapping men. Um, maybe, maybe less like me, right? Maybe, maybe more like, I don't know. I'm looking around the room. I'll take, I'll take Elbert Page and James Perry. That's what I'll take, honestly. If I've got to move a giant stone, those are my guys in the room I'm going to take because they've moved some rocks before. But, but I mean, they, they don't know what to do. And their entire focus is on the dead Jesus Christ. And guys, I think sometimes we live in that focus as Christians. I've told the story before, but I've taught, uh, I don't know, hundreds probably of students how to share their faith. And one of the things that students struggle with when they share the gospel of Jesus Christ, right, they're good with that God is holy and perfect. Uh, they're good with telling about how God made the world perfect. And then they're good about talking about sin, that we broke the world through sin, that our sins separated us from God, and that nothing we can do uh, can, can bring us back to God. Our sin has made a, a, a permanent separation from God. They're really good at that. And then they're great at telling the solution to the sin problem, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh who lived a holy, sinless, perfect life, just like we've seen in the book of Mark, who did nothing wrong, and then he died on the cross for your sin. And if you'll believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, right, you will be saved. You confess with your mouth to Jesus the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. They're really good about the death of Jesus and how Jesus died as a substitute for us. And then they think they're done. They just stop there. They stop with Jesus being dead in the grave. And that's not the most important part of the story. The most important part of the story is that the, what's at the end of every single gospel he comes back. Right? And these women, they don't, they don't get it. And I think a lot of times we live in that state of, of defeat. Right? When Jesus died on the cross, it looks like the end. 
It looks like the end of his ministry. It looks like the end uh, of his teaching. It looks like the end of this powerful force that swept across that part of the world. It looks like the end, but it's not the end. There's hope on the other side of that story. But we live defeated as Christians way too much. We live in the death of Jesus Christ, as in, as in where we're, 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 we don't have victory all the time. And I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, right? I'm not the guy who tells you that if you tell God what you want, that God's just going to magically give it to you. God is not a genie that you can manipulate to do what you want, right? But God is good and just, and you do have victory through Jesus Christ. We are not defeated. The thing that is bigger than you in your life, the thing that's swallowing up the sin that you can't seem to shake, whether it's pride or alcohol or uh, lust or lying, whatever your sin is that you can't stop, I want you to know there is no reason that you can't have victory from that. But we live defeated. We live with, well, I just can't. And I'm never going to be able to. Right? We, we, we live defeated lives. In church, I, I'm tired of it. I mean, I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing people come to me and think that there's no hope for them. There's hope for you. Sure, you're a scoundrel. Welcome to the club. I'm a scoundrel. There's hope for us. We're not, we're not beaten. We're not women. I mean, we may be beat down. But we're not beaten. Right, last night I was watching the Houston Astros play the New York Yankees. It was a sad day for me and my son as we sat and watched the TV. The Astros were down 7 to nothing going into the bottom of the ninth, and I felt very confident that we weren't going to win. But you know what? I watched. Because you never really know. And some of us, we feel that way, right? We feel like we're down seven runs in the bottom of the ninth, and there's no hope for us. And I want you to know there's hope. There's hope. And if our faith is locked up with Jesus Christ and not on the baseball team on Crawford Street, there's more hope for us there. Because unlike the Astros, Jesus never loses. I mean, the Astros rarely lose, let's be honest, right? But Jesus never loses. I feel bad for you Ranger fans out there today. I just want you to know, I pray for (laughs) y'all. Golly, I pray for y'all. And Jesus doesn't lose. And we focus, our focus is so often on, on defeat and victory, the problems around us. We're focused on our, 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 our financial issues. We don't have enough money in the bank to do this thing. We're focused on our family issues. We don't have a, a relationship with the person that we want to have a relationship with. Guys, I want, I want us to take our eyes off of those problems. But you know, there's a solution that's bigger than that. And that's what we pick up in, in verse 4, right? These ladies are like, who's going to move this stone, this huge problem that's never going to be there? And then looking up, right after they say that, they saw the stone had been rolled back. Now, that's a pretty cool story, right? right who's going to move the stone? Oh, my goodness, it's gone. Right? Because God is not defeated. The things that they think are problems aren't problems. Who's going to fix my problem with sin? Oh, my goodness, Jesus already fixed my problem with sin. How am I going to be able to pay my, oh my goodness, my finances are able to be taken care of. Look, God is good to take care of the problems in our world today. And so they look back, they look up and they see the stone was rolled back and it was very large. The problem was big before them. And entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And verse 6 says, he said to them, do not be alarmed, for you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, but he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. These ladies, they walk into the tomb. The problem that seemed to be overwhelming to them, the dead body of Jesus Christ, the the, the stone that was in the way, all of those problems were gone in an instant because the stone was moved and they walk in and there's a dude sitting in the tomb. Right? That's not normal, right? I, I, I was talking to someone and they said they used to sleep in a cemetery. That's not normal either, right? It was a Milano person, so for you Milano people... 
That makes a little more sense now, right? You kind of fit the picture. Yeah, I can see it, right? But, right, but I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it, graves are weird, right? They're, they're gross. They're not places you hang out. And this guy's sitting here. We know he's an angel, right? He's in a bright white robe. He's got all the angelic pictures around him. He looks like an angel as we see him. He sits there. The ladies are kind of worried. And they say, look, I know what you're looking for. I know what you're seeking. It's not here. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here because he did exactly what he said he would do. Guys, I want you to know that Jesus does exactly what he says he's going to do. Not kind of does what he says he's going to do. Not mostly does. Like, I mostly do what I say I'm going to do. If I say I'm going to be somewhere, you can count on me being there. And then when I'm not there, I'm not there. Right? But Jesus isn't Matt, and he's not you. Like, your word might be better than oak, but eventually oak breaks too, right? Right, like, like eventually we screw up. But Jesus never, never fails. He had told them three times, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be delivered over to the hands of men. Three days later, I'm going to rise again. They're like, huh? So he tells them again, and they're like, what? And he tells them again, and like, I don't get it. Three times he tells them specifically, we see it in the book of Mark, we've walked through this. Three times, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem, crucified, raised again three days later. And they're like, okay, yeah, we got it. And then like two days later, like, nope. You ever been with someone like that? Right, you talk to him for a while. I got a guy in my mind right now I'm thinking of. Like, I've talked to him until I'm blue in the face. And at the end of it, he's like, yeah, you're right. I got it, I understand. And then, like, we talk about Astros or something for a minute. And then he's like, well, what about this? And I'm like, no, we've already dealt with this. Why are we going back on this? Like, we've already dealt with the issue. Right, we forget some of the disciples forgot. They didn't understand. Jesus told them three times. They never got it. They acted like they got it. They didn't get it. The ladies walk in, they're focused on the dead body, and then all of a sudden their focus is shifted to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Guys, the, the Christian's focus should always be on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a reason that we come to church on Sundays and not on Fridays. On Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. On Friday, we watched him die, and so we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. If that's not why you're here today, surprise, it's why you're here today. We're here to celebrate the risen Savior, the one who, who did not stay dead. I've said before, maybe last Easter, death is like the champion of sin. And sin runs their champion out there, and it's death. And death is like nine billion and O. Oh. And then Jesus steps up to face death, and death loses. No one beats death but Christ. And since Christ is our champion, we win too, right? We get to share vicariously through his victory. We get to live as champions. Uh, I mean, I, I love sports. I mentioned a few different sports today. Some of you are like, I don't like sports. I don't understand all these sports metaphors, right? What's going on here? Right? I'm, I'm a Rockdale Tiger fan. I'm sorry, all of you, Cameron Yeoman, Bill, and uh, <laughs> Milano Eagles, Thorndale Bulldogs, or whatever your school of choice is, right? I'm a Rockdale fan. I love Rockdale. Rockdale, uh, we haven't lost yet, right? Uh, and, and I love it, right? But what I love about sports is I can say we haven't lost yet. There's a couple of things interesting about that. First of all, I'm not currently on the Rockdale Tiger football team. Last I checked. Brandon, am I? No, no, I'm not. Right, I'm not a coach for the Rockdale Tiger football team. I have no input uh, in there other than talking to a couple of the players uh, every Wednesday night when they come to youth and, and giving them a hard time, right? But I get to say we, like we, we tore Lago up. I mean, that's what we did. Sorry, Lago, right? We, we beat you. And then in two weeks, Cameron, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry, but it, it's what's going to happen, right? We, we get to celebrate. And then if we don't, right, if we don't, we, we, we feel it together, right? Because we have an identity that's tied up there. And that, that, that identity that's tied up with our sports rooting or whatever like that should be so much less than our identity that's tied up with Jesus Christ. Jesus is our champion. And you know what? He won. 
And so live your life like you've won something, guys. Live your life like you have victory over sin and death. Live your life like you have hope for a better future because Jesus promises us these things. And Jesus never breaks his word. These ladies didn't know what was going on. Their life was radically changed. They left astonished and amazed because Jesus was exactly what he said he was. And some of you need to grab on to that today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want you to know you can have victory with Jesus. You can grab onto that today and that can be your victory too. You can say, death can't beat me because I'm on the winner's side. Now, if you've already claimed Jesus Christ, if you've already uh, uh, received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you've confessed uh, uh, him with your mouth, you've believed in him, with your heart that God raised him from the dead, if that's true of you, stop living like a loser. You're not a loser. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We've won, guys. The victory is waiting for us. So run like someone who's going to win. Guys, we get so focused on the nonsense. I I love sports and I hate politics. I, I know politics, but I hate it. Everyone loses in politics. Everyone. The ugliest things I see are about this stupid politics nonsense. Guys, church, we're better than that. Like, you can vote, vote, please vote, and be proud of your vote, and love your country, and all that. But guys, your focus is wrong. If you think, and guys, I've got strong opinions, so you can talk to me about them, but if you think that Party X is going to destroy or save the country... I want you to know none of that is true. Jesus Christ is going to destroy or save this country. It's going to happen through the church leading people to repentance and discovery of who he is. Our focus is wrong. Our focus is on things that lose instead of on things that never fail. Guys, let's wrap ourselves up in Jesus Christ. Let's claim him as our victory. And you can have victory through Christ's victory too.